Hello and welcome to this CNBC Africa special. I'm Chris Bishop. Now, COVID-19, it hit everybody in business hard. There's been a lot of talk in Africa about uh, cooperation and public-private partnerships when it comes to fighting this pandemic. Now, a man who is at the center of all of this is a man by the name of Thomas Schaefer, the CEO of Volkswagen South Africa, who joins me uh, now live on the line. Uh, Thomas, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, what did you think? Do you think that like a lot of people maybe in business at the time, perhaps you underestimated how hard this impact was going to be uh, with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Absolutely. I mean, this hit us all almost out of nowhere. Um, we, we've seen what happened in China and uh, then coming over to Europe, mainly in Italy. And then, I mean, it's unbelievable that the world got upside down the way it is. It's incredible, actually, when you think about it, just uh, towards the end of last year, there was a report of a couple of cases somewhere in China, but we did, people didn't take any notice. But uh, how devastating is it likely to be for people like yourself in manufacturing in Africa? Well, I mean, at, at the moment, we, we don't really know what the implications are going to be. I mean, we, we obviously, the, the numbers look dire um, in the domestic market as well as in export, but, but that could also be influenced by, by many other factors, uh, like the export numbers. We are highly dependent on, uh, like, the UK as a main uh, export market. Um, UK is still closed, so we don't know what the uh, development is going to be in the UK. Um, we have markets like Germany or other European markets, France, that are talking about a, a bias incentive. So customers are actually holding back. They, they're thinking that maybe next week there's going to be an announcement by government um, to buy, to get like an incentive of 1,000, 2,000 euros or more. Um, so they're holding back the purchase. So we don't really know what's going to happen. But um, we have the figures we're working with now, it uh, yeah, doesn't look good. And uh, in terms of fighting this, um, this pandemic, that's the thing I want to concentrate really in this first half of the show. Uh, Public-private partnership, it uh, trips easily off the tongue. But how do you think it's been working during these, these very difficult days of COVID-19? Well, I can only say from the example that, that we've been working on, um, which is the field hospital uh, that we are setting up in uh, Port Elizabeth for COVID-positive patients for about 4,000 beds. That is a, a private-public partnership with the German government. And I must say, I'm amazed how, how pragmatic and how fast decisions can be made when there is the need for it. Um, technically, unusually, when I look back in, in, in other PPP activities, you, you often get uh, inundated by red tape and long, and, and long processes and complicated processes. But I mean, in this specific case, it shows you um, what actually can be done in a very short time period. Just give us a little bit of detail of this. I mean, 4,000 beds, that's the size of a fairly sizable hospital. Just a little bit more detail about uh, what it looks like, how you did it, but also some of the problems that you faced. Yeah, we, I mean, I'm part of the um, operations command here in, in Port Elizabeth, in Mandela Bay. We, um, they asked us as a business chamber to, to come and help come on board as, as you know, private business and, and help with the um, planning and preparation. And one thing that was desperately needed was a bigger space, like a significant amount of beds, because when I mean, total hospital capacity around here is probably about three, 3,000 beds, um, they were always talking about hopefully getting to seven, eight, 9,000 beds if we, if we needed it. And um, we have a facility in uh, Port Elizabeth that was vacant, coincidentally, at the time. We were about to sell it. And uh, we thought, well, that could be ideal. It's uh, 66,000 square meters under roof. Um, it has um, airy light coming through the, um, the ceiling. So when we showed it to the, the medical fraternity, they were immediately uh, taken. So it's ideal. Let's, let's do this. And... Yeah, so we got um, funding by the German government. I reached out to them. They listen, uh, now is the time to come on board. Uh, we always talk about supporting Africa. And now is a good time to do so. Um, they agreed. Um, and we, we are now we're making the beds. We get this whole facility literally turnkey ready. So you can imagine uh, um, dividers about 1.40 meter 40 high, um, beds head to head, and then 
4,000 of them, about 800 of them oxygenated with um, continuous positive airway pressure application, CPAP, where people get oxygen directly. Yeah, so um, that'll be um, ready phase one, about 1,500 beds by the uh, 22nd of June, about four weeks. Okay, so then you will be receiving your first patients there. Yes. And um, in it's, it's terms of uh, running um, this, um, this sort of makeshift well, hospital, I understand it's in the old Ford factory in Port Elizabeth, just for people who know. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of that, I mean, how, how difficult is that? I mean, you're a man who is, builds cars. Um, how, how does it uh, translate to actually running or overseeing a hospital type thing like this? Yeah, so we have a clear um, responsibility split. We figured out pretty early that you know we are not the people who can run a hospital. We we can get it ready. We can plan and execute, and we're good at projects and, and getting facilities ready. But um, running it is not our strength. So we um, we have an agreement with the Department of Health, Eastern Cape. They take over the responsibility, the running, the man, the staffing, uh, the processes, everything. The municipality will help with the uh, you know electricity, water, and all that. Uh, so we basically get get it turnkey ready with all the equipment in on the 22nd of June, give them the key and get the key back when this pandemic is hopefully over soon. And uh, what do you think about the, the, the way that uh, or the reception you've had from government officials here in South Africa when, you, when you've come up with this idea and you said, OK, you've got the money, you want to put it in, make it happen. What was the, the reaction like from day one? Oh, I think that was was great. Uh, was ve very much welcomed by everybody. I mean, very encouraging words by our president. Also in the speech that he gave uh, last week, um, Minister of, of Health, uh, Mr. Kiese, he personally thanked me. So there's lots of gratitude for this, and um, I'm, I'm you know I'm really positively surprised that that we got this all pulled off the ground um, with the uh, you know German government and all that. They were super keen to help and and very pragmatic in their approach. And the South African government was was very um, supportive up to now. Everything we asked for in terms of approvals and you know, everything was done timelessly. So I think we can pull this off the ground nicely. And uh, it's not the only thing you're doing as part of this public-private partnership. Also, you set up a little manufacturing base to make ventilators, of which there's a huge shortage on this continent. Just as a background of what you were trying to do there. Yeah, so our sister company, Seat in Spain, Barcelona, um, they had developed a low-cost ventilator. And I mean, by low-cost, usual ventilators, they're like half a million rand plus. Um, here's a low-cost ventilator that hasn't got all the functions, but it can keep a person alive. And um, that costs about 10,000 rand. So we experimented with that. We got the design transferred. We did our 3D printing. And, and now we're ready to, to make the ventilators at about... 100 pieces a day we can make now in Newton Hag. We have a small production line that we build up. Um, and the equipment is now out for uh, for the medical testing and approvals. And it, you know, we're ready to go if, if the need comes in and the orders come in, we, we can execute it. It's a very thrifty machine um, that people can operate. You don't need like a one year training to get it done. And I understand you do have the capacity to make 100 a day. Um, you've made 20 so far. but. You are waiting now to get um, government health department approval on these ventilators. How long is that likely to take? Well, we don't know. I think um, when the, if the need uh, arises, it probably will go a lot faster than normal. But um, there are normal processes that the government has to work through. I understand that. I mean, it's people's lives, so it's, it's important. It's done thoroughly. Um, we believe from all the... Uh, evidence we have in, in Europe that this machine can deliver. Uh, we're obviously not in the, in the business of making and selling such machines, so you know it's not in our hands to, to decide that. But uh, we're ready and stand by to, to ma manufacture it if, if the need arises. I think it's probably going to be soon. Now you have other operations in Rwanda, in Ghana, for instance. Um, how will you will you try to export these ventilators, or are you going to try to replicate? your hospital idea to those other countries? Well, we're in close contact with our <clears throat> subsidiaries in, in these countries. Um, yesterday, we had a long call with Rwanda. There's an idea to, to get them 300 of these ventilators um, because they really don't have enough. I think they've got about less than 10 in the country, which uh, 
there's, there's dire need for that. But it's like the same everywhere. Ventilators are not the, the usual kind of equipment that is available in, in, in hospitals on the continent. So, so we're talking to them at the moment. Um, we'll see if we can wrap this up next week, potentially. Ghana is uh, pretty much um, further already in their in the progress. Now they're opening up slowly. The, the numbers are under control. Um, not not exactly sure what they've done better than we, but um, at the moment there's no need to export um, equipment from us to, to Ghana. And just another point, um, they're starting to uh, open up the factory again. You uh, came back to work essentially in the beginning of May. Um, what uh, difficulties do you have to overcome in uh, this COVID-19 pandemic? I mean, it must be a bit difficult in places to have social distancing, etc., in a car factory. We, we were one of the first companies that started on the 4th of May. Um, it, it took a bit of time, you know, we, had, we spent a lot of time to, to, to set the factory up so that we have a, what we call a COVID-proof system that keeps the people maximum safe from uh, infections. Learnings are from China. Um, you know, in China, we've got 23 factories that are at least the size of Judenhek, and they've been operational now at full speed since uh, the beginning of uh, March. And uh, since then, there are no new cases, so it can be done. You know, it's, it's all about um, maximum distancing and production lines where we um, separate the people as much as we can. We have the canteens closed. We have uh, disinfectant everywhere. Mask, personal protection equipment. So, you know, we believe that the system we have is, uh, is safe, um, as safe as it can be. I'm very surprised about the, the discipline of our people, um, all the way to the transport. I mean, when people come with taxis, um, they keep the space, they keep the masks on, they're sanitizing. I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going to start now with the third shift on Monday. And this is, um, so far, it's, it's holding. Okay, Thomas, just keep that thought there. I'm speaking to Thomas Schaefer, the CEO of Volkswagen here in Africa uh, and the CNBC Africa special. Do stay tuned. The second half, we're going to be looking at the car industry here, not only in Africa, but around the world. And he'll be giving us his insights there. Do stay with us. Let's go to a break. Welcome back to the CNBC Africa special. I'm Chris Bishop. Now we're looking at the uh, effect of the public-private partnerships and the unified response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which undoubtedly has had a big effect on business here in Africa. I'm speaking to Thomas Schaefer, the CEO of Volkswagen here in Africa, um, a man who's uh, had to deal with quite a lot in the last couple of months now. Thomas, just to start with, just give us an idea of the kind of uh, financial damage that it did to your business. I mean, the whole of April, basically, you were shut down. You didn't produce anything. Uh, you probably didn't export very much either. Just give us an idea of what the picture was. Well, um, so we, we were in, in really good shape coming out of last year uh, as a company. We had a record year of, uh, of our existence, which is about almost 70 years. Next year is our birthday in South Africa. Um, but, you know, situations like that bring you to your knees very quickly. We are a very capital intensive business. Um, there was basically no income. The dealers are closed. The uh, uh, export was closed for a while. So, so we are looking at, you know, we obviously prioritizing cash flow, but if the opening wouldn't have happened as it has now, it's going to be in level three as from 1st of June, um, we would have run to serious trouble in this country. Serious trouble. And you think so, that um, also, sorry, Thomas, and, and you were saying that uh, the prospects aren't that good either. You were saying that normally it's about 360,000 new cars was the size of the market here in South Africa. And you reckon it might go as low as 230,000 cars because the rental market has collapsed as well. Yeah, so that's passenger cars, uh, you're correct, Chris, um, mm. without p uh, pickups and uh, minibuses. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a number that is unsustainable in 230,000 cars uh, is, is crazy. We should be as a country on at least 500,000 cars. You now that's where the, the, the automotive master plan is aiming towards, you know, the way we want to move forward. So this year is going to be 
a tough year. Um, it's we got to right size and got to move forward and, and work with those numbers. Nothing else you can do. Tourism isn't uh, isn't happening. Um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a tough number. And uh, for a company like us with uh, with huge market share in this country, we've got about 20 percent plus market share in the um, in the passenger car market. You can do the math. And you've been in the car business for a very long time. I mean, how would you compare this? Have you ever seen anything like this before in your time no. in the car trade? No, absolutely not. Not even, not even in, the, um, in the tough times of the economic downturn in the, at the end of uh, the previous um, decade. But um, it's, it's something that I would have sworn is impossible. Beginning of the year when I was speaking with my, my bank in Germany, like the normal year feedback, um, they were asking me if, if I see an impact on um, on business and you know this this funny thing that's happening in China. And I was saying, listen, I, I lived in Malaysia in a long time while, while SARS was happening and all that. It's it's a thing that comes and goes. Not to worry. I think it was one of the biggest mistakes and wrong assumptions that I, I heard in a long time. And uh, the the effects are going to go on and on for yourself. You said about right sizing there. I mean, any work at all, any estimates on what kind of jobs could be at stake in the car industry here in South Africa? Well, if, if the markets drop by um, 25 or 30 percent, if that doesn't pick up beginning of next year, um, then that al already means loss of jobs for sure in the same kind of ratio. Because uh, you cannot keep shifts active. I mean, when, you, when the volume doesn't come back, why do you need the people on board? You know, you're not sustainable. You cannot, you cannot hold this. The costs will eat you up. Capital intensive business. We are, we are we're obviously working very strongly on avoiding this. You know, we're in a global network, and that's the beauty of it. You know, we're not producing just for South Africa. We produce for the rest of the world, and export plays a strong role in our business. About two thirds at the moment. We believe that we can, with clever allocation and, and our cost position here, we can we can hopefully make up some of that and. and uh, then go better into 2021 with the old numbers again, hopefully. But we don't know. Right now, it's it's crystal ball. We don't. We actually really don't know what, um, what the, the next future will bring in the short term horizon. We'll see. Well, everybody's talking at the moment about the new normal in business. Everything's going to change. It'll be unrecognizable. What changes, uh, immediate changes, do you think you're going to have to make as you ramp up back to production? And again, how costly might they be for you as a business? Everything is obviously going a lot more digital. Uh, there's also this kind of working from home seems to become the new norm, which is not bad. And for um, business seems to be doable the way we've been doing it now in the last couple of weeks. The rest of it, you know, the question will be all around rental, uh, tourism, rental cars, tourism, um, stuff like that. So how do we how do we develop economically uh, the rest of the business? You know, the, the people I've spent now quite a few times coming back to work, talk to the people on the production line. It's not a problem. You know, people can work. They've got masks on. That's about it. And so people are um, are able to do their work the same way. You've got to pay more attention. Less shaking hands and kissing, but other than that, yeah, I think we can push through this. And what I keep on saying, the experience from China is positive. You know, they've, they've gone through this. They've now, you know, the, the car sales are back. They've lost a little bit more than a month. So what? You know? So this is something that one can live through with, with decisive um, action coming back um, to production and back into the economy. And this is luckily now happening. Um, lockdown was good. Doing it too long is going to be a problem. So now going back to work and hopefully pick it up and leave that all behind us. And on top of this, uh, Thomas, you had problems before COVID-19. I remember us talking in Cape Town in September at the World Economic Forum, saying that you were concerned at the time only about Brexit and how it was going to affect exports from here. Just give us an idea of how those figures have played out since Brexit happened at the beginning of the year. Luckily, the, the South African government has, you know, before the, the deadline, had put um, an agreement together with, with the UK. So, so we are fine, even now with a recent announcement that the UK is going to um, impose a tariff for imported vehicles. That doesn't affect cars from South Africa. So 
So really well done uh, from our Department of Trade and Industry. That's we, we're okay with all of that. It is really demand driven now from the UK, um, where the weak rent obviously helps uh, a little bit. But uh, I mean, we've exported last year about 108,000 vehicles um, as Volkswagen from Newton Hague. And so far, year to date, we have exported 31,000 cars. So it's, it's still a few months in the year. And again, it's now time to pick it up. And we, we have made cars for the rest of the world. And people are very happy with our quality and our cost position. So I think we, we, we can pick this up again. But can you see those exports recovering even by the end of next year? Yeah, we, we hope so. I mean, this year is obviously going to be affected, but um, we'll have to work through this next year. Um, probably slightly less than, than this year. The real recovery everybody's talking about, supposedly um, 2022. But, but who knows? I mean, it depends on if there are indeed incentive programs, um, buyers incentives in the uh, export countries. Um, that could change the picture completely. But do you think also we'll that... Ma- this but do you think those buyer incentives will come yes. along in yes. Europe at this stage? Um, bearing in mind that the European economy is suffering just as much as the economy here. Yeah, but uh, France has uh, this week announced uh, a strong incentive that they want to put into, into the economy, especially around automotive. Um, in Germany, it's still an ongoing debate. Um, I, I think that something will come. And if it's not directly linked with automotive, it will be linked with the economies. And if the economies pick up um, across Europe, then that will help us with specifically with the kind of vehicle we export from from the South African market. But I mean, I'd just like to know also, you know, what your view is of the European car market. And there are so many links here in Africa uh, with uh, with that huge market. I mean. Uh, Nissan's closed down its Barcelona operation. It's uh, preserved the Sunderland one. But I was seeing figures this morning from the UK saying that only 197 cars were produced uh, where in a country where about 120,000 are turned out every year. Uh, what is your view on the parlour state of the uh, European car industry? Well, the, the Europe as a market is super strong, and um, I think that will also come back swiftly. I'm not so worried about that. The, the, the manufacturing setup is in a sort of in a change process. I mean, it's tragic what um, what's happening now with certain brands and, and the way uh, locations are closed because of economic pressure, obviously. But in the automotive business is a multinational business. It's a network that, that usually works together. You need to stay competitive. The reason we are in business here is because we are internationally competitive. If you lose that competitive edge, um, cars get produced elsewhere. You know, there's uh, there's a overcapacity in, in many places in the world, whether it's in India, in Mexico, um, even Czech Republic, Poland. So it's a myth to believe that uh, the current structures will stay forever. You have to fight for that um, efficiency and for that competitiveness, otherwise you, you're not continuing. Well, let's try to be a little bit more hopeful as well before as we get to the end of this show. But um, uh, someone was uh, saying the other day uh, to me, one of the analysts was saying, like in a war, I mean, maybe um, technology is going to move a lot faster now than it has been in recent years. Uh, what are your hopes for uh, Volkswagen to make the transition to hybrids? and to electric cars? I think that the, the road to electrification is, is very clear. We've, um, we've gone out there in the media with a clear strategy, uh, starting with our new generation with ID3 now in the middle of the year globally. Um, the only future is electric, as you can see at the moment. The hybrid is just an expensive transition phase. Um, you have to go electric ultimately, otherwise, you know, this is the cheapest way of converting energy into, into mobility. It will come. I think this this crisis will probably accelerate the, the sort of the, the the development speed that we are seeing. You know, and the when you, when you see how many entities are, are going into electric mobility, building batteries and, and research in that field, I think we will probably see development surges as we go forward, um, similar to always compared to the 
the memory sticks. You know, when it first came out, you had like 500 something kilobytes and you paid a fortune for it. Then everybody applied their mind. Now you get like a terabyte on a, on a stick and it uh, costs almost nothing. Similar development we'll probably see with uh, battery technology and uh, and the more get produced and it, it will get into a whole different field. I think there's a there's a hope that the crisis might accelerate it. And there's also a lot of talk that the European company, countries specifically uh, want to rather put the incentives into uh, modern mobility and, and greener mobility, which I think is right. That's Thomas Schaefer, the CEO of Volkswagen here in Africa. And uh, I must say, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on this edition, this uh, CNBC Africa special on the unified public and private response to COVID-19. From me, Chris Bishop and the team, it's goodbye.